So, Sophia, let's start. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your knowledge uh, in BHEC conference. That's a pretty, pretty cool from your side. And uh, feel free to introduce yourself. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Um, let me know if there's any problem with audio or, or video or anything. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, hardware implants in general and how they might apply to telecom and specifically new discussion around uh, 5G, 5G telecom that's, uh, that's been in the news recently. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I run a company called Margin Research here in uh, New York City. Um, and we do you know, all sorts of different types of work and a lot of um, our work recently has been with DARPA um, and other organizations like that. Um, but in addition to this, I've also published um, kind of a good deal about cyber policy and um, how it might affect uh, geopolitics today. And so um, you can read up some on some of my uh, discussions there on blogs like Lawfare um, and other policy things. So if people are interested, I can link those at the end. All right, so to start off with, we're going to go through uh, a little bit about hardware implants, like I said, um, and move over to um, 5G. So I'm not going to go into this, but I'm sure everyone is aware of what this picture presents um, and how you know Bloomberg alleged uh, that there was a hardware implant in Supermicro uh, Micro's motherboards, and they were distributed to large firms across the country or across the world. Um, and so, of course, that was a huge scandal because um, they claimed a lot and they had little evidence to back this up. Um, but the idea was that uh, there was backdoors inserted into Supermicro's uh, motherboards and they reached over almost 30 U.S. companies, large companies like Apple and Amazon, um, breaking supply chain trust. And so this issue specifically with hardware implants really revolves around the idea of trusting a supply chain of hardware manufacturing. Um, and so, of course, this is a huge problem um, and a huge allegation at the time. And a lot of fingers were pointed, um, in this case, specifically at China. So I love this, this kind of is a joke slide, but um, you can see here that, you know, corn would be the U.S. hardware implant and the rice was the Chinese one. <laughs> That's really dumb. Um, but yeah, so if we take a step back when looking at the Supermicro case, which we'll kind of go into more details a little bit later, um, or hardware implants in general. Um, the real question is, do we trust our supply chain? Um, and how can we view this at kind of a macro scale? So when looking at entire system in uh, kind of from the top down, uh, when we're looking at a technology stack, we have data, applications, we might have virtual machines or virtualized environments, operating systems, firmware, all the way down to hardware. And so if you're a security specialist, you might specialize in one of these different categories. You might look specifically at data security encryption. You might look at uh, virtualization environments like Docker containers or um, VMware or, or isolating uh, different things in the cloud. Um, or you might look for vulnerabilities in software, operating systems or firmware. Um, and in general, we have a pretty good understanding of how to secure these different layers um, of our environment. Uh, we know how encryption works. We know how to find bugs with compilers. Um, we know what constitutes an issue in a piece of software, and we can check for this at scale across many different releases of the same piece of software. So the example I like to give is if you reverse engineer a piece of code, and you say, okay, this has no bugs or backdoors, this is secure, you can take the hash of that piece of code and match it against the hash of, of all distributed copies of that piece of code. Um, and that's a way you can validate that the security premise um, applies across all releases um, or all distributions of that software. Uh, with hardware, uh, we're kind of stuck, right? So you can't just take the hash of a motherboard and match it against all distributed copies of that motherboard. Um, and so proving security, not just in one single piece of equipment, um, but across all dist distributions of the same piece of equipment coming off some sort of supply chain or um, coming out of a processing plant uh, is much harder. 
Um, and so when we're looking at uh, supply chain security or threats against potential hardware um, methods, we can break these down into different categories. So uh, we have external standalone implants, uh, peripheral implants, internal implants, uh, and so forth. And so just to get some concrete examples of that, uh, we might have our external implant, um, which you know could be wiretapping or um, simply adding something kind of at, at a remote standpoint. Um, we have our physical peripherals, which I'm sure everyone here has played around with a little bit, like rubber duckies or um, plug and pong sort of devices, that sort of thing. Um, but then if we kind of go underneath the hood a little bit, uh, we have different types of implants. So uh, specifically PCB implants, um, which would be where the Bloomberg alleged hack falls underneath. So they said that the Supermicro motherboard had an implant on the motherboard that would be under a PCB implant. Um, and then we also have SOC implants or system on chip implants. So that means when you have to decap um, a chip and then look to see if there's something changed on it. And so these are kind of the lower level types of implants. Uh, so going back to look at the Bloomberg implant, of course, this the allegation was that something um, that looked like a signal conditioning coupler uh, was added to the motherboard. Um, and of course, without much more to go off of than this, uh, when your company is tasked with reviewing all of a commercial entity's purchase purchases from Supermicro, it uh, becomes quite difficult to check to see if something like that looked like this was actually on the board. Um, and so that even though, you know, even though the Bloomberg report generated a lot of work for people who do hardware, hardware reverse engineering, um, it is in fact quite difficult to check uh, to see if something like this is actually uh, maliciously added to a motherboard. Um, all right. And so kind of looking closer at these PCB implant style uh, attacks, we can kind of uh, start labeling different, different methodologies that could be used. And so we have something that's pretty simple called um, you know, the sandwich in this case. And so, um, and this was also actually discussed in a different talk by Bunny um, at Blue Hack Security, which is a Microsoft conference. Um, but the idea here is that something is added in between two layers, um, modifying the TSV or the through silicon via uh, connections. And so this would be our wafer level uh, chip scaling packaging. Uh, and there'd be different solder in connect interconnections uh, between um, the layered elements of the chip. And so if we take a close look at what that might look like, we could simply say that there is an additional substrate added between um, other things in the chip. And so something like this wouldn't be visible just through optical inspection of the board or of the chip. You'd actually have to delayer the chip or take an x-ray or that sort of thing. Uh, and so this can also be thought of as um, man in the middle silicon. Um, and so it's kind of like modifying the connections or the signals that are being sent um, from potentially the, maybe the GPU um, layers and the graphics card and that sort of thing. Um, so it's changing the logic of how the chip works. Um, and the funny thing is, is this method of attack is actually very cheap. Um, it just requires an understanding of how chips work. Uh, and so the threat here would be that the inside of a factory, when a company requests a certain specification um, of a new chip, um, the chip coming back might actually have additional functionality uh, than what they requested. Um, so this is one example of that. Um, and so kind of looking through security of these, you know, multi-layered or 3D chips, um, I came across the Intel's new 3D chip packaging, and they had a special section on the Wikipedia page for it, uh, for circuit security. And they uh, believe that the 3D integration security is achieved through obscurity. Um, and that was the only point underneath security uh, for their chip design. Uh, and that unfortunately is true for a lot of hardware security. Um, so like I said, for hardware security, it's very hard to you know, prove that something's vulnerable or not, or maliciously added or not. And it's also hard to determine optically if something is connected wrong. Um, and so security through obscurity is pretty much 
the default choice by manufacturers because uh, hardware is very infrequently looked at. Um, so for example, software can be reverse engineered pretty easily, but to reverse engineer a chip or a motherboard um, is actually quite difficult and requires equipment that most people don't have. Um, yeah, so that's pretty funny. Uh, then we have um, a different category like to call the ad, and this is what I was talking about uh, with the, the Bloomberg hack or the alleged Bloomberg hack. And the idea here is that something's just added on the board. Um, and note that the real difficulty with this is that something added to a motherboard can be legitimate. Uh, so the example is one component is moved from one pad to another or one component is replaced with a cheaper component at manufacturing time um, and that sort of thing. So oftentimes you'll see manufacturers when they create a motherboard or a design, they'll actually swap out parts um, or swap out one part for two separate parts that might have the same functionality, but it's not what was requested or advertised um, from the manufacturer. And they do this most of the time for price or for cost. Um, so oftentimes plants and um, plants when requested to make a board will actually pocket the difference between the cheaper parts and the more expensive parts uh, and claim that the more expensive parts on the board even though it's cheaper. And so it's not necessarily malicious or a backdoor, uh, but it's something that when you're reverse engineering a motherboard or a chip, that sort of thing, um, will come across as odd. And so you'll see, okay, why is this different than the specification? And the usual reason is uh, price and people being cheap. Um, okay, so an additional ad uh, can also be inside of a package. Um, and so you can have a legitimate flash memory package and that sort of thing. Um, but you can have the same chip or a different chip wire bound differently. And so you can have an additional um, functionality or additional configuration. Um, and again, usually this is for cost purposes. So uh, when someone's looking at a board and it may be connected differently or have additional functionality, it may be that the manufacturing plant decided, um, oh, I can make um, one board and sell it to two companies if I just make them both have two different functionalities or the two functionalities that um, are desired. Um, and that'll cut down on costs for manufacturing and that sort of thing. Um, and again, the swap. Uh, and so this picture was actually taken from Trammell Hudson's example, which he presented at CCC uh, or Chaos Communication Congress, um, I believe two years ago now. And so the idea here is that there's a passive implant um, on the motherboard, and this would be able to bypass any sort of uh, optical inspection um, or detection of uh, by a security expert. Um, yeah, but so the idea here is you'd be able to flip one zeros to ones in flash memory, uh, and this would alter enough data to get command ex execution on the board. Um, and so you can actually, by replacing or swapping out parts um, from passive to active parts, uh, you can do things like add shadow memory, um, enlarge EEPROM, modify system control behavior. You can really do a lot. Um, and so one easier way to detect this actually is um, to take the specification and find all the passive parts or components on the board and determine which of those are passive on the board and which of those are active. Uh, and usually a swap of passive to active indicates there's a problem that needs to be looked at. Um, but like I said, the most likely um, scenario here is that um, there was a cost benefit analysis done by the manufacturing plant and they deemed that it'd be much cheaper um, to make something not exactly to specification. Um, and so, yeah, so again, this isn't really a security issue, but from a supply chain integrity standpoint, um, this might be a risk to you if you um, are basing your security understanding of your board off the fact that, you know, X, Y, and Z parts are actually on the board or not. Um, and so again, there might be some issues there. Um, okay, so we take, took a look at a few different examples of uh, in general hardware or you know, supply chain um, issues and where you might add an implant. Um, but how does this necessarily relate to the 5G question um, that people have been talking about recently? 
besides the fact that, of course, 5G is also uh, in part a hardware uh, capability. Um, so I always joke about this. So it's what people think 5G is uh, and then what 5G actually is. Um, so this is a simplified uh, block diagram of a base trans, uh, transceiver station um, for 5G equipment. Uh, and this shows the essential components uh, that comprise the transmit chain for these base stations. Um, yeah, so this is kind of just under the hood what actual 5G is. Um, and so for those who don't know, the real innovation in 5G is the fact that they, it uses millimeter wavelength technology. Um, and there's actually two different frequencies that matter for 5G. So we have this millimeter wavelength and then we have a long distance one as well. Um, so higher frequency in general means high bandwidth. Um, and so when you get these higher frequencies, we have higher bandwidth so we can stream YouTube, we can text more, the connection's better. Uh, but the issue is that it's a shorter range now. And what does shorter range mean? It means that you need more base stations and they need to be closer together. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot more of these uh, base station or physical devices um, around a given area. Um, yeah, and so historically we have these tall, you know, 4G towers um, or 3G towers. And so now instead the 5G um, base stations have been replaced with this idea of small cells. Um, and these are kind of smaller or, or designed to be installed on existing buildings or on existing poles um, around the city. But yeah, so the main idea here is that with 5G, there's going to be more of these physical boxes, these base stations around a given area. So yeah, in general, we have higher speeds, uh, we have higher compression, um, and also capacity. Um, and we have this issue of coverage now. So now that we're using the, this uh, higher frequency uh, bandwidth or higher frequency wavelength, we need something to actually um, kind of assist in getting signals between long distances. So higher frequency means that things um, can only be really tra traveled or connected short distance to each other. Um, and so we also need what's known as the sub six gigahertz wavelength. Um, so wavelengths in that spectrum, uh, and this would be required for national coverage uh, to offset that millimeter wavelength shortcoming. Um, and so in the US at least, a company called in IntelSat currently sits on a lot of this spectrum. Um, but in general, a lot of different companies have already been using sub six gigahertz, uh, the spectrum at large. And so um, ha it has been a bit of a policy issue uh, to get those or some of those wavelengths opened up. Um, and so one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but is a critical component of 5G is the idea that it's now going to be almost like an IoT device. And so not only can it act as a base station, but your router can connect to it directly now. Your refrigerator should be able to connect to it directly. Uh, so a lot of these devices are now going to be designed to connect to these 5G base stations directly. Uh, and that's one of the additional benefits of using 5G. So yeah, again, more base stations, but then also more base stations to hack. And so you're kind of increasing that fingerprint um, around the world. Um, so this is actually an image of the Nokia's base station for 5G. So you can see that it's very much not like a tower, um, which is what you traditionally would think of you know, for 4G or 3G, that sort of thing. Um, and so the funny thing is because 5G base stations are now designed to connect to um, many different types of devices and sensors and all these things, um, they're basically designed differently. So the idea with these base stations is that there's more of them uh, and now they're going to be remotely managed as well. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more services on each individual base station uh, to support all these connected devices and to support being remotely managed and updated. Um, so there's a lot of different services and uh, configurations that these are now kind of running. So of course, more services means maybe more bugs too. Um, yeah, and so the idea is that it's remotely managed um, and that's also something that might cause issues down the road. Uh, so just to put this in perspective, um, on one of, of these companies' base stations, I won't really say which one, but uh, 
um, there was, uh, it was using Docker and, you know, um, Docker and uh, HTTPD services to uh, run different things. Uh, so they're really acting like an IoT device. Um, and then of course, when we talk about 5G, we have to talk about some other issues that have been at least big in the news recently. So Huawei has come up so many times now, uh, it's not even funny. Um, and so the idea with Huawei is that um, they're you know, a huge company, they're almost larger than Apple, um, and they're a global phone manufacturer is really how they got their started start. Um, but one thing they also supply is they're also um, releasing or they offer uh, their own 5G base station um, offering or product. And uh, due to heavily, heavy subsidies by the Chinese government, um, they're 30% below um, competitors uh, for other 5G, 5G companies. So they're much cheaper um, than other companies around the world. And this has, of course, become a huge debate. So this is from last year, but um, it's really split or divided a lot of different countries um, in the world about which, you know, to, uh, should we use Huawei or should we not? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and actually, I think this is a little old because Mexico has also come out and made a statement uh, already. Um, yeah. And so there's been a lot of funny things that have come out of this as well. And so we have, you know, uh, the FCC in the United States with his big rhesus mug, um, <laughs> basically coming out and saying, or getting into fights publicly with Huawei on Twitter and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, but the real debate can be kind of divided into two separate categories. We have a national security discussion uh, to be talked about, as well as a geopolitics um, and cost discussion. So if we look at national security first, um, we can look at the fact that most Chinese companies are beholden um, to their government, at least in part, um, and so that their government in China can compel Huawei or other companies based in China um, to basically do you know whatever they really need from a national security standpoint. So they can say, okay, you should backdoor devices, um, hand over data from different servers, et cetera. And so um, you'd have to allow China's Ministry of Public Security, which is their name for their national security group, uh, to access network and data um, that the company provides. Um, and so we can look at certain laws that have been passed to indicate this. And so there's a national intelligence law from 2017, um, and this was on regulation and inter internet security supervision. Um, and that was also, again, reaffirmed in 2019. Um, the idea there is the government has the final say in what a company can and cannot do and what a company has to give to the government. Um, and so there is an ongoing lawsuit in the state of Texas, at least in the United States, um, that Huawei is trying to, to sue the FCC um, in the United States um, and saying, okay, you know, a lot of your uh, you know, bans of certain equipment like ZTE and Huawei um, it's a protectionist ban, and then we're, of course, coming back and saying uh, it's a national security concern. Um, and, of course, one can argue that, uh, especially in China, they don't really have an idea of division of uh, government and commercial entities. And so that's definitely something that people need to think about, at least, when considering uh, the supply chain security and when considering um, hardware secu security, so the sourcing of these pieces of equipment. Um, and then on the other side, so kind of some benefits, we have uh, just purely cheaper equipment. And so a lot of these um, base stations coming out of Huawei are drastically cheaper than any other offering, and they're cheaper for a reason. Um, and that's because the Chinese government, with their new um, One Belt, One Road initiative, really wants their equipment to be used around the world. And so they're heavily subsidized and invested in getting these, uh, these base, sta base stations used. Um, and then, of course, there's some geopolitical concerns. So is it easier to avoid tension and just saying, OK, yes, we'll use your equipment um, and kind of just placating uh, different co companies? Or do you want to actually come out and say something strong about it? Uh, and it turns out most nations or most groups really don't want to. And so the EU has refused to issue any sort of blanket statement. Um, 
And many other countries have had issues with this as well, including Britain um, and Germany. And so in Germany, it was pretty funny because uh, their president, Merkel, refused to really come out and say anything about Huawei, whereas their um, spy chief or their defense department um, had in Germany, uh, you know, came out and said some very strong things about Huawei and, and China. And so there's a lot of infighting now, um, creating disunity. Um, and specifically in Brazil, uh, this happened actually earlier this month, um, which I thought was kind of interesting, is uh, Brazilian telecoms, they came out and said, you know, no one can tell us what to do. Um, we want to be able to freely make our uh, decision based on what the best financial decision is. Um, and so I think this goes to show that the fact that Huawei can offer something that's 30% cheaper or more um, is very interesting. Um, and so Brazil already uses Huawei equipment um, for other things as well and um, in preparation for auctioning of spectrum concessions. So like that millimeter wavelength and sub-zero, sub-six gigahertz wavelength auction. Um, yeah, and so that's stuff that probably we'll hear about the news again. Um, so this is kind of just a layout of different countries in South America that um, have strong uh, use of different Chinese telecoms particularly. And so we can see here, the color is not the best, but um, most of the countries on in the Western side uh, are participating already in the BR, our BRI initiative. So that one belt, one road initiative. Um, and then of course, there's also the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, agreement or membership that um, countries are looking at as well. And so a lot of times hardware and 5G becomes a huge geopolitical um, interest as well, just because it's literally a physical element um, in the national um, you know, critical infrastructure of a company or a country. So telecom, that sort of thing is very important. Um, we see this actually have already, has already really taken place in developing economies, primarily Africa. Um, and so the African Union um, is, is almost 100% funded by China and they have a new headquarters, which is also um, being run and operated by China right now um, in Africa and particularly Nigeria, um, where Huawei was caught exfiltrating data um, to modify uh, the election results in some of those countries. Um, and so the African Union does have an issue with um, Chinese control of almost all of their critical infrastructure and almost all of their telecom. Um, but unfortunately, like I was saying earlier, there's that cost element there. So if a country has to decide between not having, you know, telecom equipment and um, getting, you know, almost free telecom equipment, they're going to probably pick the free telecom equipment. Um, yeah, so a lot of different things at play there. And so again, very cheap. Um, and it, and it work, pretty much works out of the box, whereas um, Nokia's base station um, doesn't necessarily. Um, okay, and so just looking at kind of a technical comparison, um, it turns out that uh, Huawei is the best option for um, all these different kind of metrics that people have been looking at. Um, so this is kind of some funny one, uh, but it, it really goes to show that there's not a ton of options as well in this space, and I think this indicates a different issue with our hardware kind of supply chain security and the at issue is um, kind of options. And so there's not a ton of companies that manufacture or design telecom equipment or hardware in general, right? So there's not a ton of motherboard manufacturers anymore. There's not a ton of PCB or system on chip manufacturers. Um, and so similarly with um, 5G base stations, there's not a ton of companies out there that actually can design and manufacture uh, this, these physical pieces of equipment anymore. So I think we see this happening um, in every facet of, of hardware, um, just because the costs are so high compared to software um, to actually really design and develop and manufacture. Um, okay. uh, so let's take a bit, look we're going to take a little bit of, of a look at some risks associated with um, just base stations in general and specifically um, with the, so the integration of software and hardware together. Um, so a lot of people have been kind of 
talking about what types of risks could be associated with these base stations. Um, and the idea is, of course, there could be a back door um, or a bug door in that case. So could there be something like the super micro hack um, on these boards where something's added to the base station itself, which sends data home and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, the answer is um, there's many different options of how you could modify a motherboard or how you could modify a base station um, to have these negative consequences. Um, and it's harder to prove. Um, and of course, with base stations, we have this remote update uh, functionality now, which is a critical change from what it was before. And that's also an issue that, um, from a security standpoint, we'll have to address. Um, and of course, from policy standpoint, it might be difficult to enforce data regulation, um, and that sort of thing, if you're not entirely sure how uh, the base station's managing uh, the data of different IoT devices um, as they're connected to it. Um, and of course, there's a few different consequences that people might be concerned about. Uh, and this is true for any company that's coming in and modifying uh, your telecom in a country, in any country. So you could have intelligence collection, um, you could have um, knocked out service. So something could just go black, you know, all the service just dies and everything breaks um, or gets shut off. Um, and you could have, you know, a bunch of different problems. So um, I think in general over the past year, what we've really determined is that unfortunately 5G is not, you know, even though it's about fast speeds and zero latency, um, at a global level, it really represents um, these political and dominant problems and economics issues. Um, and so it's almost become a geopolitical issue more than a technology one, even though I think that a lot of the security around the technology needs to be looked at much further. Um, yeah, so it's basically saying the same thing. Um, and now, so this is a section that I think is actually pretty funny. So uh, the UK tried to take a critical security look at 5G base stations. Um, and they put a task force together to really um, kind of pull it apart from a technology standpoint and try and find and mitigate any security issues um, that could be there. And so the, the whole, the framework for this is the CIA, the triad, so confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, and so the idea was, these are some proposed mitigations. If you don't necessarily trust your infrastructure, you can use um, VPNs. For end to end encryption, you can um, you know, assume an insecure channel. Um, in terms of availability, if someone else is in charge of uh, maintenance of your infrastructure, nothing's really stopping them from turning off service of that infrastructure. Um, and you'd also maybe need backup equipment as well. And so, unfortunately for them, um, you know, encryption doesn't necessarily always solve confidentiality, as we've learned. Metadata is still useful. Um, loss of integrity is still possible, even if there's encrypted data. Um, and so if we already have a backup option, why don't we just use that one? So there's a lot of different issues with their proposed mitigations um, that we thought that the team had put out in the end. Um, but taking a, look, a closer look at this, um, the UK we actually received the code and devices uh, from the base station manufacturer. Um, and the idea was that they said, okay, we can you know, only use these in commercial sectors. We can have enhanced monitoring to try and keep it safe. Um, and just basically try and get multiple vendors or multiple backups into the network. Um, but if you take a closer look at the final report from the UK, so you know, before all these mitigations were proposed, um, they found some pretty interesting or funny uh, technical issues. So um, GCHQ in the UK has an official working group called the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center. Now this group, it's pretty large actually, it's been running for about nine years now, um, or 10, 10 now. And this working group has continued to identify concerns um, in Huawei equipment um, in general. So, and this is because Huawei is you know, so large, they make so much, so many different types of equipment um, that is widely used in the UK. Um, so this task force is looking at not only 5G base stations, but a lot of different devices. Um, and so the group's report actually 
um, determined that the security risks couldn't be managed, they were so bad. Um, and so here's kind of some choice examples from the report. Um, so we have here that um, in the source code provided by Huawei, they found that um, there was a function called safe library memcopy, and that was just a macro uh, to wrap memcopy. And that another memcopy was actually a wrapper around safe memcopy. So in the source code, they were swapping the different memcopies. So at compile time, uh, the insecure one would be used when safe memcopy was called and vice versa. Um, so we thought this was a pretty funny kind of issue that at compiled at source code auditing time looked fine, but then at compile time, the insecure function would be placed in. Um, and additionally, uh, they found that there were 70 full copies of OpenSSL that were used th throughout the code base, um, you know, versions ranging from 0 0.9 to 1.0, um, and there was partial copies of 14 different versions. Um, and so the funny thing was that all of these copies were used in, to some extent, given how library paths were used and that sort of thing. Um, and so none, none of them could actually be removed um, in order to compile it. And so there was a large number of files spread throughout the code base. Um, and it was almost every version of OpenSSL that you could possibly want. And so it was just different functions from these different versions were used throughout the different, different sections of the code. Um, so from a security perspective, this is one of those things that you definitely see in telecom equipment, but it was pretty funny still. Um, yeah, so, and again, um, one thing that GCHQ's team um, was concerned about and thought they might have found was some bug doors um, in the code. And so bug doors, the idea is that you're intentionally writing unsafe code, um, making it trivial to exploit or trivial to actually get code execution. Um, and so this is a tweet from Zerodium um, where they alleged that the Tor browser had a serious bug door um, in no script, which is the safest security level. Um, and so the idea was that um, the bug is so easy that it was obviously intentional. It was obviously intended to be used as a vulnerability when the code was written. And a reason a company might want to do this is because when you have a bug door added to your code, um, you can, you know, write it off as being a mistake or say, oh, we didn't mean to add that, that, you know, our developer is a dumb, dumb, or that sort of thing. Um, and so the idea is, is that uh, you could kind of sneak these bugs in um, and no one can blame you for them when they exist. And so of course, 5G in general, um, you know, it's just not your average junk device. So it's not your average IoT device because it's an IoT device that's um, all the other IoT devices in the area are connected to it um, and then connecting to the rest of the world from there. Um, and based on that GCHQ report, they found that, you know, the Huawei code is exceptionally bad there. Um, yeah, so a lot of issues with the source code there. Um, and so these, these are, this is a slide about some different examples um, that we found as well. And so um, the one that you see on the right, so uh, there was a, so Windows Defender, um, when you launched your new um, Matebook laptop, uh, Windows Defender reported a Huawei driver um, immediately as, you know, flaking it as a backdoor, or flaking it as malicious. And this is a driver that was shipped with the laptop uh, from the factory or from the manufacturing plant to the end user. Um, and so Microsoft flagged it as uh, a remote backdoor, um, which enabled access to the operating system um, and the kernel um, by default. And so you can kind of see it down here. It's called LPE underscore POC. .exe, um, and the driver had no additional functionality besides this. Um, and so Windows Defender caught this on the first release of this laptop series in March, um, and then everyone started complaining about it. Um, and then the US issued kind of a ban on the laptop and Huawei complained in June um, that you know, this was protectionist and kind of a bad ban. 
but they still remove their laptops from market. Um, and the new Mate book laptops do not have this driver on them. So it was a pretty funny, funny example there. Um, but in general, as we learned from the Supermicro case um, way back when Bloomberg reported on it, uh, that hardware backdoors are actually very hard to prove as being intentional or not. Um, and so the idea is that a true hardware backdoor is really undetectable from a mistake or from the factory being cheap um, or from, you know, lack of integrity in your supply chain of your the parts going into the motherboard. Um, and so it's very hard to say, okay, this is an intentional backdoor or this is just a mistake. Um, and, but at the end of the day, if you, if you control hardware manufacturing or the fabrication of chips, uh, you really control the device and, and all functionality of that device. Um, so that's something to consider when looking at um, acquiring or purchasing um, pieces of hardware. Um, and so some takeaways from this and from my team kind of slaving away at looking at some of these super micro boards is that risk mitigation is almost impossible to do when it comes to hardware. Um, unless you fully trust every company in the supply chain of the manufacturing of that piece of hardware. Because um, at the end of the day, you can never say with absolute certainty that there's a security guarantee or security property that holds um, on a piece of purchased equipment. Um, and so this is a real issue that's an example of broader supply chain risk uh, in the global economy. Um, and so you ha might have one manufacturing company that then um, exports or subcontracts out to another manufacturing company for a specific part and so forth. And so you get this long chain of, of suppliers who don't really know much about each other. Um, and so at the end of the day, we really need policy decisions to be informed with an understanding of these technical issues. Um, otherwise, we'll get policy which attempts to mitigate risk uh, without actually doing anything meaningful. Um, and of course, this can sometimes be confused with mi mixing trade and national security, uh, which is, of course, another issue uh, that needs to be looked at, especially with uh, the 5G, 5G discussion. Um, all right, so thanks for listening to me. Um, this is a few ways to get in contact with me if you have any questions you don't want to um, mention here in the talk. Um, and yeah, so I'll take any questions now if people have them. Sophia, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, let's wait a little bit uh, if someone has some question. Uh, for now, right now, we don't have questions. <laughs> let's uh, wait. Guess I can keep talking. Did anyone see the new um, the GR security? I don't know if people listen to GR security. Um, so it was pretty funny. Uh, this one guy, he he works with the open source community for the Linux kernel. And he was reading through the new merge request and he was like, <laughs> this feature that someone was trying to merge literally has no functionality. Uh, mark, marks a segment of memory as executable and adds a clear buffer overflow into that segment of memory. <laughs> And it's then the function returns and there's no fun like it's never used like the buffer is never used yeah so you know the, the people it's super smart right <laughs> oh gosh um uh sophia so so far no questions uh also mm -hmm. you uh left your contacts so if someone has some question oh, yeah. they can you know yeah. directly uh, contact you uh, so again, thank you so much for your uh, you know, participation and share your knowledge. Uh, thank you so much for taking part for the BHEC. And that's it. Uh, you know, so you are closing with the golden key. <laughs> thank you so much.